The benchmark values policy is already kicking up a lot of dust between stakeholders. Now, last year around this time, um, we saw a lot of uh, parliamentary chaos where um, there was the voting for the speaker and that led to a lot of, you know, fighting in parliament. It almost seemed as if just as they started is how they ended with more fighting at the end of the parliamentary session. But what are some of the big issues that we may be seeing in 2022? Are there some issues from 2021 that dovetail into 2022? And so we will have to continue to address all those issues. What are some of the big issues we should look ahead for? Well, I'm here uh, to do that discussion with Professor David Abdullahi, Senior uh, Governance Advisor, Africa Center for uh, I think I got the designation wrong. I beg your pardon. Yes, it's uh, different. I beg your pardon. I'll correct that. But um, Professor David Abdullahi to my far left. And then, of course, I have Manasse Azure Awini, who is the editor in chief of the Fourth Estate. Thank you both uh, for uh, joining me. So, 2021 was quite a busy news year. So, let me start um, with you. Uh, Professor Abdullahi, what are your thoughts about what were the big news items in uh, 2021 before we talk about 2022? And you are the senior advisor, African Parliamentary Network Against Corruption. Yes. All right. So thank thanks. you very much, Jifa. Thank you, uh, my colleague on the show. And thank you to your viewers. I think for me, what is one of the big news was our debt. If you look at our debt, the last time I checked before I came on the show, our debt to GDP is about 83 point something percent. That means about close to 30 percent of government revenue goes to pay interest. It's a big issue. It has an impact on development and moving forward, we need to do something about it. Apart from that, I think also you, you saw some of the economic challenges we have and uh, where cost of a uh, 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 basic stuff that most people buy has gone up, transportation has gone up, and that also affects our quality of life. And then of course COVID-19 is a big issue. We cannot talk about 2021 and moving into 2022 without talking about COVID-19 and its impact on uh, our economy. But it's not going to go away. In fact, we are getting different mutations of the virus and uh, I think uh, um, our, our policymakers and others need to uh, uh, step up to the plate and do something about it. But also, you know, the, the, the attitude of Ghanaians. I see a lot of people, with the, they don't mask, they don't follow the protocols, as if there is nothing that is happening. It's, it's a big issue. It is going to be a big issue in 2022. But also, I think, uh, uh, for me, when you talked about security, um, I'm very impressed with the new IGP, I think uh, he's bringing some sanity into our system. Um, um, I, I, can, I can tell you that, uh, you know, uh, that aspect has been missing for far too long. And I think it's, it's one of the big issues. All right, great. So for you, debt, the sustainability for us, the state of our economy, cost of goods and services brought on by taxes, COVID-19, yes. and then, of course, the new IGP's yes. performance since August uh, 2021. Great. Yes. Manasse, what for you were the big issues in 2021? Well, quite a number of them. Uh, one of them had to do with uh, the Fix the Country movement. This isn't the first time a movement is giving us hope. I think somewhere in 2014, there about when Occupy Ghana happened, a lot of people said, well, the middle class and some people in the upper class were now getting interested in the affairs of the country. So we're looking forward to something that would uh, at least bridge the gap between the working class and then the ruling class. Unfortunately, this is not what we saw. Uh, though a few of them are still committed to the cause, a chunk of them as time would reveal, did that to perhaps shore up their own uh, human capital and get into politics and abandon the very values that they stood for. When Fix the Country's movement started, this was just a collection of young people who were outraged at the things that were happening. And I can say for a fact that the government was shaking. 
we saw the finance minister holding press conferences on Sundays, which uh, never happened before. <laughs> so some of us who also spoke to some ministers and uh, some people in government also realized that they took it very seriously. We are only hoping that things would uh, continue that way, not only fix the country, but the young people in this country begin to take the governance seriously. Related to that was the unfortunate murder of Kaka, and uh, some people within the governing MPP, uh, we are told they were pulling station executives or whatever, were arrested. Another they, person. They were, they were party um, supporters yes. and activists. Yes. yes. And then later on, uh, we're told his brother was also picked up under very questionable conditions. And we are only hoping that the police would be able to get to the bottom of this so that we know who actually killed Kaka. But there's no doubt that he was a serious activist against some of the bad governors within his locality and that created a lot of enemies for him. 2021 also saw the death of the fight against corruption in terms of the role of the Auditor General. And 2021 also convinced those who doubted that the Kufuado, our president, is not committed to the fight against corruption. If anybody ever doubted, the hounding out of uh, Daniel Yadomelevu uh, his hounding out of office was a very clear indication. And also the role the judiciary in the country played was also very unfortunate. And I say this because eventually the case uh, that led him to eventually vacate office, he tackled the Kroll and Associates, which Yasaf Maf was involved. But a very critical aspect of it went to court. The group that he was auditing, both Kroll, the finance ministry, Osafumafu and others, they refused to give him some documents and they claimed it was national security in nature so they couldn't give it out, it was confidential. Eventually went to the Supreme Court for interpretation. If the Supreme Court had ruled that those documents shouldn't be exempted, it was going to be difficult for or Safumafu and his people to win the appeal. But the Supreme Court rather ordered them to go and then see the documents. And by the time they would go and see the documents, Domelevo was taken out, and whoever the government chose to represent him, a day later said, oh, we've seen it and we are okay with it. It went back to the High Court and then Osafumafu and others won. And we know some people went to court, including Professor Kwekwasa, Kwekwasa to the Supreme Court to uh, challenge that decision, to even ask him to proceed on leave and all of that. It was never ruled in time. And then eventually, he went and then withdrew the case. So that was also uh, something that started in 2020, came into 2021. Uh, COVID-19, as he mentioned, was also very uh, topical. And of course, Dan Paris' appointment, for me, is. Uh, one of the best things that ever happened to us as a country. It has come to show us that whatever excuses people give, that, well, Ghana is not only about the leadership, it's the people, their mindset and everything. So if you have any politician who is there saying, well, as a president, you can't do much because the people have a very bad attitude, mindset and whatever. I think Dan Paris' appointment and what he has demonstrated so far goes to show that if you are elected to the Jubilee House and you are not able to effect change, then your character and competence needs to be questioned and not the character and competence of the people you are leading because the Ghana Police Service was one institution that nobody ever thought that in my lifetime, I didn't think that I would ever want to mention the Ghana Police Service or I, I, I would ever think of the Ghana Police Service and the next thing I'll think about is integrity, respect, and all the good accolades that uh, now you hear of the police service and something, your, your heart gets lighter instead of heavy, as we saw in the past. So his appointment has come to prove that, look, if we have a good leader, if you have somebody with character principles, and he didn't come issuing uh, threats or press statements or this action man, if you don't do this, no. When he came, he never spoke 
just quietly and the right things have been done. And the good thing is that it isn't only the lowly people. Whenever somebody puts something on social media about a driver or somebody misbehaving, the next moment he's arrested. Parliamentarians and politicians who are misbehaving with their VAs have not been spared. And even police personnel, wherever across the country, they do not misbehave and get away with it these days. So that kind of leadership is what uh, gives me hope that one day, if Ghana ever gets a leader, I think after Nkrumah, we have really not gotten a leader. As we sit here as a country, we don't have a leader. We have a president, but we don't have a leader. So if we ever get a leader, people are so well, Ghana, Ghana be yeni. If we ever get a leader like Dampare occupying the Jubilee House or the Flagstaff House, depending on who wants to occupy and call it what, I think we should be able to go far. Then finally, there was this news that wasn't so big enough, but for me it was very important. It came from Parliament that uh, the Speaker instructing the uh, Employment and Labor Relations Committee to investigate the fact that Ghana government allocates 600 Ghana cities for the sweepers, 45,000 of them who are to clean the streets, the market, the gutters, the drains, and all those dirty places, 600 cities, but at the end of a sing every month, only 180 Ghana cities goes to them. I first brought this to the light or to the attention of the nation in 2013 when I did the JIDA scandal. And then the MPP said the Mahama government and Zoom line were conniving to defraud the state. And when they won, they are continuing with that. And I think this uh, injustice and wickedness that is perpetuated against the poor people, the poor shippers, they don't have insurance, they don't have pension, they don't have anything. Their transportation to even where they work, everything comes from the 180 Ghana cities a month. And I think parliament and then the executive should end this injustice at least in 2022. All right. Thanks very much, Manasseh, for that. Uh, so for you, Fix the Country, Medal of Kaka, the, the fight against corruption, uh, the removal of uh, Domelevo, COVID-19, and of course, Dampare, and of course, this issue with the uh, sweepers, yes, has always been, I know, a matter very close uh, to your heart. So I, I, I understand where you are, you are coming from. But looking at all that happened in 2022. Professor Abdullah, some will say that the near split parliament that we were gifted, so to speak, by Ghanaians and the election of Speaker Bagwin had, it started as a big story and it ended as a big issue. So looking into 2022, what are some of your big projections maybe? Is parliament um, gonna be one of them? Well. Yes, Parliament is going to be one of them. I think what is important for us to understand is that previously uh, uh, the ruling party had a super majority and they could you know, uh, take decisions that take into consideration the, what the minority thinks. But right now with a split Parliament, I think it is making it very clear that our democracy is beginning to at least, uh, 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 what do we say, crawl. Uh, and I think it's going to be important moving forward. Is it, is it going to get worse? Do you project a worsening? Because it's two things. The near split parliament, many predicted it as Ghanaians want the two sides to work and get consensus for our benefit. Yes. But yet we've seen situations where issues have been stalled. Yes. There's been significant um, disagreement, yes. walkouts, you yes. know, and fighting. Yes. Well, I hope we don't get to the point where the, it, it brings about a deadlock or, or like what we see in the United States. But what I think is important is that at the end of the day, you know, um, Ghanaian politicians, especially those in parliament, must begin to understand that they should work with their conscience. I think whether you agree with what your party says or not, you just don't really vote based on party lines whether you don't agree with the issue. Isn't that, uh, isn't that too, of, um, what's the word? An utopia that we are imagining for, for Ghana that may not exist. No, no, it, will, it, it, it is not an Ethiopia. I think, you know, uh, democracy is a process. And I think what is important is that 
as most people begin to realize that they are voted by their people to represent them in parliament, not because of the party. They need to make those kind of decisions. If not, when you make decisions that are not very healthy, uh, when you go back, people are not going to vote you back into parliament. And I think what happened to the minority was during the approval of most of the, uh, the, the, the current ministers, um, they first talked about the fact that they were going to vote against specific ministers, but then later on they approved them. They heard from their constituencies. And I think, uh, for me, it's, it's, it's good. Uh, Sometimes, out of chaos, something good comes. Mm -hmm. If not, if it was just a rubber stamp parliament, and every, then we're not going to get the best out of them. So I think it is going to be a big issue moving forward. But I think at the end of the day, cool has to reign so that uh, um, we can be able to move our democracy ahead. There's mm -hmm. no, I've seen around the world, there have been parliaments whereby there are brawls and and so this is not the first time, but I think it's good. For me, it's going to be an issue in 2022. We just hope that uh, at the end of the day, at least they can consult us. We hear that they are now trying to do. And not because you had a certain majority, whether they like it or not, you just pass the bills. No, we don't, we don't so, think that. So, the, so there's a certain um, responsibility on the majority side to, yes. to work to achieve consensus. Yes, and I think that is a learning process, which they are beginning to do. If they never face these challenges, especially with the minority standing up and saying, no, we're not going to allow this to happen. I think we will begin to question ourselves why such an issue is contributing to our democracy. Mm -hmm. So uh, I am optimistic. Okay, what, what else do you think we'll be dealing with for 2022? Well, I think what is important we've not talked about is the whole issue of external threats to our security. External threats yes. to security. If you look at what is happening in Burkina Faso, in Niger, uh, in Chad and other areas where the jihadists are, you know, we should be very careful. Anytime such a thing is happening next, next door to us, they need to be serious uh, thought into how we can uh, prevent that. I think it is going to be a big issue if you let our guards down it will affect our country and the image and the investments coming in. Another big issue is that, um, uh, again, vis-a-vis -vis the national debt and revenue generation. If you look at the fact that, uh, uh, like I mentioned earlier, Jifa, that our national debt is actually is projected that by 2022, it could go to 84.87%, which is going to be very difficult, especially when sources of revenues are limited and the number of people that pay taxes in this country are very limited and if the government has to go out to raise monies or um, they will charge us a lot of high interest rates and if they decide to raise money domestically they will crowd out most of the businesses and also interest rates will rise so it is going to be a very dire economic situation moving forward and i think it is something that is going to be important in 2022 Another thing I think would be an issue is a talk about the amendment of the 1992 constitution. Um, the, the amendment of the constitution. Yes. Yes, that was, uh, that gained some momentum last year as well. Yes. Yes, fix the country, raised yes. it. Yes. I did do an interview with the majority leader where he did talk extensively about what work the parliamentary affairs ministry had done yes. on a path to making some suggestions. So yes. yeah, it's interesting you raise yes. that. And, and, and I think there is a general consensus that it was a constitution that was uh, brought to fore by a military government and it's time for it to move on and at least... Do you, do you think people would go along with that? I mean, knowing fully well that you've mentioned revenue generation issues, national debt issues, yes. and just before you came on air, yes. we've been speaking about benchmarking policy, mm -hmm. which is really a debate about whether government needs more revenue and whether they should reverse mm -hmm. an incentive they give to, to local uh, importers. And I like, do you think people really care, knowing that they care about the economy and all that, do you think they would care about amending the constitution? Well, I mean, uh, uh, the, the economy doesn't survive in a vacuum, it leaves within the constitution of the country and the laws and, and, and the regulations that enhance the, the, the economy. Yes, I think people will. It might not gain prominence like the economy because those are bread and butter issues that people are facing, but it is an important thing that needs to be 
looked at and, 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 and be taken on. The other thing, uh, Jifa, that I wanted to mention is the issue of uh, industrial action and strikes. <laughs> we might see that uh, with the economy being very difficult in 2022, and uh, we've already seen that. Uh, uh, the, the year started very. Yeah, they've already started. The year started very actively. <laughs> yes. So uh, it's going to be an issue that needs to be looked at clearly and how to solve it. Because you know, once you have a lot of uh, uh, um, organizations striking, then you know it affects the economy. Now, uh, in South Africa, there is a season for strikes. Oh. Then <laughs> when that time comes, there's a lot of strikes going on. It does usually affect the economy seriously. I think here, too, uh, we're beginning to see semblance of that, and it needs to be really looked at. And it is something that you guys should be busy with as, uh, as journalists yeah. in, in 2022. Okay, so let me, let me put a pause on you there. I'll come back to your other... Yes. Uh, uh, points. Uh, Manasseh, what about you? What do you see as some of the big issues we'll have to deal with? You're a journalist as well, editor-in-chief uh, as well for this year. What will we have to be tackling maybe? Well, quite a number of things and I would want to go back to Parliament okay. because the fight hasn't ended. And I have said that the fight is not necessarily very negative. So if the slap one another at the end of the day the reason they are slapping one another should be more important than the slapping even though the slapping is not something that should happen but just to let everyone know though that anything that happens on the floor of parliament is privileged so i remember some people said people needed to prosecute who for slapping who or assaulting who the truth is that can't happen really well i think there's always a limit to everything i am not a lawyer but I don't think that if one parliamentarian stops another to death on the floor of parliament... No, certainly when death comes in, it becomes a difficult matter. Yes, yeah, so the, 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 the process is leading to the death because somebody can also be hit with the hand and the person can lose their life. So, I so Yes, of course, you don't want to encourage uh, yes. fighting in the house. Yes. No, certainly not. Yes. But, uh, but for mm -hmm. some of these uh, misunderstandings, the e-levy... We would be paying now. So, do you I, think e-levy will happen? Well, the government appears very adamant. And sometimes when they are talking about consensus building in parliament, you'd expect that at times the government or the executive would gauge the mood of the people first and also consider the fact that they don't have those absolute numbers, like in the past, to push through everything. If you even have the numbers, you have a speaker who is not on your side. So it is a bit difficult. So I least expected that after the election, they will still be talking about this EJAPA deal. And it appears some people have some serious interest in EJAPA, for which reason they do not even want it to slip, because there are people in the governing party who are not even in favor of it. So if such a policy is splitting heads, and you don't have the absolute majority to push your people through, or sorry, your policies through you, take out certain things. The e-levy, I would have expected that, at least by now, the government would have made a bit of a concession. Overwhelmingly, it is going to have a lot of negative effects on individuals, on businesses, on uh, remittances and all. So people are not happy about it. If you say 1.75% and the whole country is up in arms, then I expected the government to have come to let's go. We've heard uh, your concerns. This must be done because we are in serious trouble. And if the so called good managers of the economy would now have to rely on the East Levy to survive, then we are in trouble. But they should have said at least we are bringing it to let's say 1%. Uh, psychologically, the people would begin to think that, well, even though it's not good enough, the government thinks about about us, about our concerns, but the government is adamant. Rather, it is the telcos that we are told uh, we're able to take 0.25%. No, they've not taken it out yet as far as I know. I think the view was if government passes the E-Levy yes. and it's approved, the way the telcos would want to Support. cushion yes. 
uh, consumers would be to also reduce a percentage yeah, of their charges. Charge, yes. yeah. So if the telcos are prepared to do this, then one would have expected the government to at least say, okay, we're also taking a percentage out. So that once you do that, psychologically, you let the people know that, well, the government cares about us. You'll be making some concession with the opposition uh, may not be happy with, but at least they would also begin to think in a bit of reasonable terms. So but, e levy is a, a potential problem. Yes, if it the goes potential. Through. Yes. And then you, you are concerned that Eja, the Ejapa royalties deal to is an well, issue. Well, the, the government still claims that it hasn't abandoned the idea. No, it hasn't. Yes, it hasn't. And eventually, I foresee the electronic transactions, the volumes are likely to drop. Because sometimes I pay for groceries with mobile money. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I buy fuel with mobile money. And uh, sometimes you order something online. And there's this argument about so who pays the charges. Sometimes you can decide to take it. The seller can decide to take it because it is not so much. But with what is happening, it's now going to be uh, a problem. So instead of taking the money and putting it on my, uh, in my wallet and then paying tax on it, I can go and then withdraw cash and then only do the electronic transactions when it is extremely necessary or impossible to use cash. Consumers are rational beings and I think that is also going to affect a lot of people because if you go to everywhere in this country, including villages, you're likely to find somebody somewhere who is doing mobile money and that person has a lot of uh, people who may depend on them. So I heard somewhere that the finance minister said the uh, e-levy was going to create uh, about 11 million jobs and I said, well, sometimes they think they are speaking to kindergarten children. How many uh, people are jobless, uh, the adult population, how many are jobless? going to create 11 million jobs in what sectors what i i'm not sure he said it that way though just for clarification i think what he said was they were going to um secure revenue from the e-levy yes. which would now go into uh, the creation of jobs into projects that would support or or you know activities or initiatives in fact the word i'm looking for initiatives that will then support youth employment. I yes. think that was. And the yeah. figure they mentioned the was figure 11 million. The figure seems a bit high. I must admit, the figure yes. is high. Because there's a question, the, the criticism is um, we've had all these very productive sectors of the economy cocoa, gold, timber, this, that, and m much of our youth still remain unemployed. Oil. Much of our youth still remain unemployed. So there's a skepticism that saying that taking money from the e-levy to invest may, may not generate. But apart from e-levy, what are your, your other issues uh, for 2022? Well, I think generally corruption is not going to stop. And the number of the... Yes, corruption is not going to stop, but will it be an issue to be talked about? And I'll come to Prof on that. Is oh. Because I almost get a sense that many Ghanaians have for want of a better word, almost thrown their hands up in the air. They have, but once the scandals come up, people are going to talk about them. Uh, they've thrown their hands in the air, not because they don't care about them, but they've gotten to that point that it seems nobody is ever going to be punished for anything that is not right. And if you even look at the latest Auditor General's report, previously there were such charges and disallowances and uh, people who were cited in it knew that it wouldn't end with the uh, Parliament's Accounts Committee just discussing it, making the headlines, but they had to go to court to try to challenge and all of that came with uh, a bit of apprehension on the part of those who were cited. But if you look at the very latest one, for instance, there was a report that the newly created assemblies, was it 38 or 48 of them, paid money for sanitation services to Zoom Lion and uh, the work wasn't done. There was even no contract. They were not supposed to pay that money. And the uh, Auditor General's explanation was that instead of going back to take your money, which 
was deducted. Normally, these deductions are made at, at source at the district assembly's common fund secretariat. The assemblies are saying, oh, they will give the company more work to do to cover it. So these are assemblies, a lot of them, they are people still share water with, drink water with animals. Students in the basics who some study under trees are very terrible structures. So they need this money. But the very irrational explanation is given that, well, we agree that this money that went to this private company was not supposed to have gone. We are supposed to take it back, but we are saying instead of taking it back, we'll give this person more work to do. What more work are you going to give other than what the contract stipulates? And then the Auditor General says, well, they said that they should uh, furnish them with uh, details of the work they were going to give. So when there is a lot of, uh, uh, I don't know how to put it. Not just the misapplication, but we've gotten to a point that people know that we can do the wrong things and get away with it. <laughs> and like this Auditor General's uh, report now becoming like what it used to be, then there's going to be a lot of incentive for people to continue to do the wrong things. So corruption for you, um, another big issue. I, I know you still have some points, but let me bring uh, Professor Abdullah in on that. What's your reading on, on the corruption space about how Ghanaians feel because there seems to be a sense that many feel like we are not really getting anywhere yes. with this matter yes and there have been instances where we are yet to see some full prosecutions yes so I'm just wondering is that a major campaign matter for uh, the parliamentary network against corruption in 2022? Well, corruption has always been at the fore of whatever we, we, we did. Certainly. But I, I think that, um, Jifa, what we're talking about corruption, a lot of people are fed up. And what we don't want to get to in this country is when there's pent up anger and people take the laws into their own hands. That is what we should make sure that we prosecute people that uh, take care of. Let me give you an example. If you look at a Transparency International Index, Ghana dropped from 2020 uh, when we were at 43 points to 41, and 2022, we ex it is expected that we we'll drop again to 40. Now, the other thing that it can trigger is the whole notion of international pressures, whereby when we go out to look for support for our, our developmental policies, you know, most of the bilateral and international organizations would talk about the fact that, look, you need to get the corruption in your house in order. I just came back from Namibia where we did the economic governance uh, uh, review of the country, and you could see that uh, even though their corruption perception is not that high, uh, the leaders are taking it serious and they're making sure that they're doing something about it. My fear is that uh, when Ghanaians are fed up, uh, 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 it is going to affect, uh, uh, you know, the elections. And I think it is going to be an issue in, in the next uh, 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 campaigns. And okay. I think next, next uh, this year, actually, 2022, is going to be an issue. Because anybody now with economic hardships, if you are in positions of responsibility and you, you do anything that has to do with um, corruption, uh, people will hand you in. Uh, so it's about hard time we started looking at ways we can fight corruption. And I think what uh, Manasi was talking about, that those people that can bring a breath of fresh air should be given the opportunity to, to operate. Yes, I, I think one of the critical areas of perceived public sector corruption is in procurement. Yes. I don't think we've seen a strong hand there yes right or wrong no you're right is this and and i say this within the context of there are going to be political party internal party contests coming yes. up soon yes and then of course the election which you you talk about i'm just wondering within the context of this public sector corruption that even the auditor general's report references about how much we've even lost I'm just wondering, what is it, is it a new leader in that space that will change anything? Because the PPA doesn't seem 
to be giving that impetus that any enough is being done. Yeah, but Jifa, then there's that also the internal audit agency yes. as well. But Jifa, that comes back to 1992 uh, constitution um, that I was talking about. If you look at the fact that in this country, is the president that uh, appoints, appoints the CEO or the heads of these public sector institutions and the board. Now, where are the checks and balances? And that is where you begin to see some aspects of corruption rear its ugly head. But if there were checks and balances, and whereby if the board sees that the CEO and his management team are not performing, and it is affecting the, uh, the development or the sustainability of the organization, then it is going to uh, 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 be a check on corruption. But right now, look, if you are from the same party and you're on the board, you're not going to hold your board, uh, uh, the CEO of your, your public sector organization to, to task, especially when he's also a member of your party or is a sympathizer of your party. So I think until we look at all these things and try to link the dots, mm -hmm. it's not going to be easy. It's not just the PPA, but even the PPA, who appoints the head of the PPA? Any government that is in power. So. That is where my fear is. And I think at the end of the day, when people are fed up and they have to take the law into their own hands, we don't want that. We don't think it's a good idea. Right, so even if corruption, Manas, I know you, you say corruption will be a big issue, but to the extent that maybe it's investigative journalists such as yourself who unearth this, people need to take a stronger interest in addressing the issues relating to corruption, I guess. Yes, they have to take a stronger interest, but they also have to see that action is being done mm -hmm. because the interest alone isn't enough so there must, this be, country, there must for be consequence instance, yes so we have now the attorney general and the office of the special prosecutor mm -hmm. they can prosecute cases of corruption sometimes you find people coming to my facebook wall or oh, you claim you have evidence on this why don't you go to court but the laws don't allow private citizens to prosecute corruption so i am thinking that as part of this constitutional review measures people are pushing for we should get to a point that individuals can prosecute corruption. If but, I have... But, but isn't it, I mean, <laughs> individuals prosecuting corruption, it means, it almost looks like putting an individual against the very might of whoever is the big fish caught up in the corruption. Well, it, that, 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 that may rather put the individual at a disadvantage. They won't have probably the resources to do that prosecution? Not just the resources. I have done investigations as a journalist. I know Shraj, for instance, has done investigations and found certain things wrong with certain government officials and private companies. And when they finish, Shraj has to take this report and go and give it to the Attorney General. Now the Attorney General is a member of the governing party, a member of government, so a lot of the time, if you find somebody who is an influential member of that government, the attorney general doesn't act. The auditor general does these reports, goes to gather evidence, but the auditor general cannot prosecute. If the auditor general could prosecute, then whoever is in government and uh, signing or buying or procuring those things would know that, look, my government cannot protect me if an audit is done and I'm found wanting. So that alone would deter. Some people would still do it anyway, but I know or believe a good number of people will begin to set up and say, no, this impunity cannot continue. So even if you take the individual out, there are still state institutions that, that should be given the power to prosecute corruption. But as it stands, we have only the attorney general and now the office of the special prosecutor, which started with a lot of uh, hope. Unfortunately, things didn't go on well. Well, it's, it's, just, well, it's again, just been one. It's just been one year. Yes. Yeah, uh, but see, I also wanted to add to what Manasseh is yes. saying. Most of those state institutions that are to fight corruption are not really well resourced. I'll give an example. The countries in Africa that are doing very well in the fight against corruption: Botswana, Mauritius and of course Rwanda, just three. Uh, there have been cases where the organization that is given the power to fight corruption in Botswana is very powerful. 
where ministers are arrested at the airport for uh, you know uh, the fact that they engage in corrupt activities and they are brought before uh, uh, the court and punished. It's the same thing in Rwanda. They even made sure that they wrote it in such a way, they are lost in such a way that it goes beyond just uh, engaging in corrupt acts. You know, it's that idea that they know the impact of corruption. In Mauritius, the whole prime minister, um, and, and a lady, had to step down because she used a credit card. She used a credit card on the board of a private foundation that she was on. And she had to step down. So where there are no consequences and where the state institutions that are supposed to be funded and resourced to fight corruption are poorly resourced, how are they going to be fight, to fight corruption? Or if the, the heads of those organizations are political appointees with the, 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 the party at heart, they're not going to be able to fight corruption. So that is where I believe what he's saying is important. But it's going to be an issue okay. moving forward. And the fear is... When people are fed up, then, you know, uh, uh, they will take the law into their own hands because they, they can't seem to see their way through 